Why, hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. My name is Mr. Dogbuff 33 and welcome back to I Find 4, New Order Last Year's Year Pass, The State of Guangdong. Now, in the last video, we started picking up the pieces as Mr. Takuji, and we ended up allying ourselves with uh, Morita and Sony in order to try to get things going. Now, we're not going to stick with them in the long run, of course, but um, I don't think I want to give Ibuka any extra... Assistance, just as a feeling, and I have a feeling that, um, I might end up liking these paths anyway, uh, these options a little bit more. So, oh, what was I going to do? Um, I'm blanking now, damn it. Um, uh, right, I was going to go ahead, because we looked at, uh, Tejuk, uh, Takuji in the last video, but we didn't check a look at some of the new positions we got. And that's new, that's new. I think all of these are new. I don't think this one's new, but the rest are. So I'll t go and read these. So Mashaharo is Guangdong's I I Iago, now our second in command. They're our head of government. The delicate politics of literally cancel and the four companies require an exceptional skill in negotiating. Matsushita is nothing if not a master of the art. When Matsushita, Buka, and Morita maneuvered their powerless colleague, Matsuzawa, into stepping in as interim chief executive, it was abundantly clear that the power would be principally in the hands of the three main tycoons. Yet the management of power behind multiple people is a tricky thing. Morita and Buka were already well known for their frequent and heated disarguments. Favoring either of them above the other could easily upend the delicate balance of power and give Matsuzawa more power than he really ought to have. With the second piece between the companies, Matsushita was a natural choice to serve as the chief secretary of Guangdong, a crucial and not entirely unbiased interlocutor between the chief executive and his peers. Next we have Akio, the voice of the people. Even as one of the heads of the four companies, Akio and Sony have always been an outsider, comfortably outvoted by Yasuda, Matsushita, and Fujitsu's combined. Yet, as Yasuda careens towards its dissolution and Suzuki abandons its post, Morita is one of the three men standing between Guangdong and total chaos. It stood to reason that, along with his new responsibilities, he would receive a title befitting his position. Morita knows full well that there are ways to signal displeasure even among insiders. The external secretary is a glorified PR position, at the best of times, an easy target for criticism in times of crisis, but even a small seat at the table gives him access to the chief executive. The one who eyes the naked maneuvering of Matsushita and Ibuka as well as Morita does. As for Morita, he is both the man of the plan and a man who can be trusted and will not let the crisis go to waste. And then Masaru, the Apostle of Progress. At first glance, the lateral movement of Buk Ibuka Masaru from the external affairs to the financial affairs portfolio is an unquestionable snub, most outspoken opposition to former executive, yet being forced to share power with his rivals. Yet Ibuka himself appears content with his position, position and public. New interim chief executive will be capably advised, he says, by the remaining tycooners, in a strictly professional and meritocratic matter. There can be no playing favorites in the wake of Yasuda's collapse. Of course, his insistence on meritocracy has long been understood as a favorite phrase of his, with only Ibuka himself up to the task of saving Guangdong. Even Matsushita maintains the appearance of neutrality, and Rita tries to make himself heard. Ibuka controls with purse strings, and the numbers never lie. Tough times require tough choices, and only one man can make them. Abuka. Well, over he'll make, end up, I don't think he'll end up making them, unfortunately, so... Yeah! So we're gonna go ahead and do a promise for the future. Yeah. Here we go. In the midst of the economic crisis, times are going to get tough. Uh, there's no way around that. As difficult as it sounds, though, we can navigate around these complex problems to work and ensure the impact of the fallout doesn't punish our workers who keep Guangdong running, even as investors grow skittish and sk shy in the face of falling profits and pro fo flocking shareholders. By no means will this be an easy task, or we must make cuts. We'll promise they will only be temporary. There's great reward in our, for our workers at the end of a tunnel, they only need to hold on and bear with us. Sure. The Italian Sultan of Egypt. 
Sure. Um, I believe... Oh, well, that's going to be interesting to see. We'll go ahead and keep the workers working. As we find ourselves occupied with a myriad of issues plaguing the nation, and the very last thing we would need right now is a horde of unemployment. Chi unemployed Chinese and Zujin workers spilling into the streets and demanding their slice of the pie. Our government is woefully underprepared for the wild chaos of protesting and violence. It is desirable that we can avoid it in its entirety. We regard it as a best for social stability across Guangdong that workers stay at the top of at their stations in some way, shape, or form. To keep the lights on for one business resumes and to keep riots from breaking out across the cities, our assurances to the working class will have to do. The Pan Asian's project is one of enterprise. The radio blared at the shop, empty except for one Kalong and his gaggle employees. Our present difficulties will soon end, and when they do, the government stands ready to put the people back to work. Applicants can receive unlimited funding to maintain their payrolls at half pay. Can you get a load of that? Zhang all but spat at the radio before turning to Wong. The Japanese stole our land and our money, and now they want to play nice. Wong regarded young Chinese sympathetically. I'm sure they have good reason. One of the Kenpai Tai thugs need a reason to do anything. <laughs> Look at this place. Nobody comes here. When we go under, some Japanese vultures gonna come in and take all this too. How do you think I still have the money to keep all of you here? Whatever the money the government will give us, I'm taking it. You don't have to believe them, but we have to take what we can get. Hanging by thread, but still hanging on. Talatory invasion of the Philippines. Well, the Filipinos continue fighting each other. Oh, Jesus Christ, that's... Well... The best place to hide something is in play sight. Day in and day out, a steady stream of notables, executive managers, employees, and other acquaintances make their way into a thoroughly unassuming office in Hong Kong. The full set of golf clubs, a wall of bookcases, stuffed with meticulously labeled binders, the neat stack of papers stacked high on the desk, everything spoke to the overall importance of the room's occupant, 15 stories above the ground. It's a place to speak freely. Promises, agreements, and contracts were haggled about and agreed upon. No creed of loyalty was too sacred to be won over. Through honey wards or cold cash, that office had borne silent witness to the best and worst of Guangdong in equal measures. And so had the unassuming piece of white device of white plastic, nestled strategically under a pile of books, but never seemed to be finished. A disused toy whose red button seemed to be permanently jammed in place. The tape reels were wisely hidden elsewhere. Alright, we're going to get some extra approval by Japan. Chinese government support is not going to be good, but eh, what are you going to do? <laughs> Kept the workers working. Um... Go ahead and delay the RS LSO. <sighs> Suzuki's magnum opus, the revised Labor Standards Ordinance, was no doubt a great achievement of its time, and guaranteed a long-term continued stability of Guangdong's industries that was long overdue. Sadly, the time and place no longer applies to our current dire position. The RSO would have been an extra burn upon our already struggling finances if ever fully implemented, so it was necessary that it be delayed due to the current situation. As we do not wish for further strain to fall upon the existing Japanese and Zujin businesses trying to meet requirements. Of course, after we have moved past the crisis, the RLSO shall be re-implemented accordingly. At least that is what we will promise the people. Uh, 
Uh, corruption is no bueno. <clears throat> the office of Machu Matsushita Konosuke in Osaka was often called the Eagle's Nest within the executive club of Matsushita's top executives. From his inner sanctum, the elder Matsushita surveyed his empire with a keen eye. Also, the younger Matsushita reflected. As he made the ascent, he, was, he made sure to keep the subordinates fit. Getting here was quite a climb. Entering the office, Matsushita quickly saw his father-in-law was in an agitated mood. The old war horse was a mercurial man to most who knew him, but Mashaharu had always been around him long enough to know his little details. Standing by the window, his jawbones were starkly outlined against his cheeks, his spine rigid, his lips razor th a razor-thin line. Innovation is where we will beat the Zaibatsu. They are old and slow, and they have no ambition outside the spear. They've left the edge that put them where they are now. Agreed, which is why I want to meet you today. We're planning on breaking into the Japanese market, and our weapons will be air conditioners. The Zaibatsus already sell them here. Where's our benefit? Cost. The Zaibatsus sell the wealthy. Their units are too expensive for anyone else. Ours, however, are far cheaper and maintain top of line quality. We'll market ours to the middle class. Asian grown market for Zaibatsu cannot reach. A smile broke across Konosuke's face at that. Our savior is always Masaharu. 29 seats in the Legislative Council. Excellent. 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 I'm going to see if we can get some political backing. June thought it'd be over. Oh, how he'd put up with it all. The manning screeching creatures of drills, the booming croaks of the foreman, the callous blossomings, calluses blossoming in his palms. Just to secure another paycheck for the family, another carrot dangling from the citadel's lace and gold. Yet the RLSO was gone. In his place, yet another broken promise, another indefinite postponement. The storm ling lingered on, suffocating the rainbow in its tenebrous clutch. June thought it'd be over. He really did, but now he could stand no more. He found himself indulging the cacophony of shouts and curses, converging upon the Guangdong government complex. The pearly moonlight dancing carefree amongst the tide, tide of bobbing, shrieking heads, aching to spill over his striped blue uniforms, cordoning the pavement. His gaze flickered from the khaki horde stationed down the boulevard with mouths strewn all over their faces. The officers in front of him struggling against his own shoves and pushes with features the same as his own yet none of his sense of fucking dignity. How many times do we have to tell you, Deflot? Our parents, our children, we're all starving out here. Why don't you tell your mighty dog masters to give a damn? Come down from the skies and talk to us. Not just keep doing jack all, standing in their own horse shit. Another shove against the baton. Answer me! As if we had a choice. The officers' bellows were almost drowned amidst the havoc, and they found their way into Chun's ears, nonetheless. As if the goddamn pay cuts weren't enough. Then the whistle blew, and the men in lapis readied their batons. Chun could vent his rage, his sorrow and frustration of the night sky all he wanted, but he cooled his mind, recomposed himself, and withdrew from disappearing crowds. Now was not the time. Not when the weight of the family rested on his shoulders. Entire horde of no good are threatening to get their paws on the goddamn government itself. What'd your buddies do? Sergeant Fujiwara's boisterous howls reverberated through the illit alleyway, crashed down on Lam ha Hao Chun's face, swinging around your baton in handcuffs, doing fuck all. You never expected our esteemed ideal officer, Hayashi Kosen, to do perform his sacred fucking duty. For heaven's sake. My apologies, Sergeant, but the order's called explicitly for restraints. Alam, honorable officer that he was, had gave his perfunctory reply without so much as a twitch on his face. Orders, orders. First the pay cuts, now this. All those 90-plus men had been Chinese, his own kin, and it was a cruel reality not wanton malice that had forced him to the cordons. What he possibly brought himself to do, even if the orders had been otherwise? How could he possibly swung his baton against his fellow countrymen? Struggling before him, confiding in him, whose youthful yet worn-out face he swore he had seen somewhere before. What? Uh, bullshit. Don't tell me you brought in Matsuzawa's good Samaritan nonsense, too. I... The middle-aged sergeant's face wide in his eyes in utter bewilderment. 
Wrath of running short and face red, red as applies. No. Oh, enough. I don't want any more excuses. Any more unwarranted leniency thrown to those savages. I catch you half-assing your job again, Hayishi, and you'll have earned yourself a demotion. The sergeant shot Lamb one more ugly look before snapping away. Once a mutt, always a mutt. He grumbled, not even trying to lower his voice. Lam, respectful officer that he was, stood yet perfectly still, posture remaining at a perfect 90 degree angle, and gaze fixated on the sergeant's back as he plodded away, till the very instant the man stepped out of the sunlight and well out of earshot. Dule lomo. Immediately the expletives hissed through his teeth. Fuck your mother. Same as it ever was. I think we'll go ahead and strike at the underworld. Targets of triads and Chokai. I'll actually deal with that. Um, we could do with some extra police boxes here, which we'll get working on, I guess, now. Work on. Ooh, before I forget. Um. No one shall go hungry. We'll try this. In German, that the needs of the populace and former workforce will be handled first as our best bet for, for surviving the horrible situation of the pseudo crisis. We manage to guarantee enough supplies and opportunities for our people now. It will surely allow us to step out of a crisis with an able and diligent workforce that will make our economy thrive and propel our nation to greater heights. Therefore, our most basic obligation would be to attend to the basic sustenance of the peoples, even at immense cost to our finances. It would surely put us at a great position to ex to, for an expeditious and guaranteed recovery. Sure. Next, we've got Suzuki's Legacy. <sighs> Suzuki Taichi was, and still is, a complicated figure for Guangdong. He had re resigned in shame and disgrace after news of his failure broke loose, but that does not mean that he was completely defunct in his thoughts and ideas. Guangdong had, for a very long time, focused on meeting the satisfactions and desires of shareholders and event investors, granting its temporary benefits at the expense of neglecting and undermining the needs of interest of the territory, Guangdong itself. Ultimately, Chief Suzuki would be a divisive figure for quite a long time, but it's better to retain some of his legacy to guarantee prosperity, harmony, and growth in the years ahead. I can probably appreciate that, I think. The product cycle helping us out. How interesting. I didn't realize that was what would happen, but... I can appreciate that. Phone rang insistently from behind the door, trilling mockingly in Chief Executive Matsuzawa's ears as he struggled to comprehend the numbers in front of him. Secretary poked her head into the empty office before hurriedly retreating from his knotted brow, interested frown. He would be accepting no calls again. The experiment, Marita's idea, he reminded himself, had started so well. The trial soup kitchens and distribution centers had kept de desperation, true desperation, the kind that leveled cities and bred anarchy at bay. The populace had lined up to buy foodstuffs provided below market costs and orderly rows and with words of gratitude. Then lines had grown longer, snarling traffic as they snaked around city blocks. The overstretched government workers struggled with great the greater hours required to service the swarm, growing swarm. Food shipments to the outlying cities rotted in the heat, bottlenecked by pothole roads and overgrown trailers. Trails. All the while, Guangdong's food stores emptied at breakneck pace, local producers having long since adjusted to their prices. Supply and demand, or the temptation to scalp the government for market distortions, had proven too hard to resist. The consequences were daubed in red ink across the ledgers on Matsuzawa's desk, painting a bleaker picture, financial picture, than before. The secretary from before placed an envelope meekly in Matsuzawa's desk from the Chinese consulate general. He gave it less than a second's glaze before setting aside to be buried and forgotten. The gratitude to China means nothing. Hmm. 
still some left. All right, let's go ahead and let's break even. We've stayed off the worst for now. The economic freefall is ground to somewhat of a halt thanks to our swift and timely decision on which sector of society prioritize sal salvaging and on the future of the RLSO. It is natural to feel tempted to breathe for a sigh of relief, yet all is not well. Far from it. Prospects of our fiscal recovery remain out of sight, with the most cynical of our benefactors already draining up, dra afting up planes of escape. Phantoms both old and new arise from their slumber, their screeching echoing across the urban skylines and through oof slums and shanty towns, and their haunting presence seeping through the fabric of society we have so meticulously woven together. Amidst all the burning wreckage is likely suit as rotting carcass, laid bare on the streets for vultures circling on all sides to sweep down and dine on. Tsuki Taichi is left behind him a freighter collapsing under its own weight and riddled with gaping holes. It's up to us to funnel all that we have left into patching it up. Guangdong shall never sink into oblivion, as long as there is one man still sitting at the helm. The bleeding is stopped. Just. The chief executive knows we're here. Barnyas has always said at the, the night he and Yoshiko had checked in the Koshu Yamato Hotel. Doesn't matter that Suzuki's gone. Surely Chief Executive Matsumawa won't turn out a meeting with a Baron, no matter how busy he does. That had been months ago, and increasingly the Baron's confidence had revealed itself as a manic front, papering over heart-draining hope. The funds stashed in the trunks to window, leaving Yoshiko stretching one meal to three, while her father desperately waited for a call that would not come. She read through her proper father's newspapers in her spare hour. Languidly at first, then with increasing purpose. Father. <sighs> Yoshito announced one morning, placing a newspaper clipping on the table. A call for writers at the Canton Fujin Koron, a woman's job requiring a university degree like her own. May I apply for this job? Work? Yoshiko, there's no need. We can't stay here forever. Nobody, not the chief executive, nor your friend will help us. I can't have you going outside into that. The Baron pointed outside her, his expression pained. Gaggle of street urchins fish for scraps from torn protest banners and tear gas canisters, branching makeshift clubs to ward away the lone policeman keeping his distance. I'll cut smoke and eat less call again. You, you won't have to worry about anything, I, I promise. Hope lasts only as long as the money does. Chief Executive Matsuzawa Takuji poured over mountains of economic and market reports that littered its desk. Each one of them hammered the same idea. Home. You see the crisis had released tremendous damage on the Japanese and Chinese markets. Those markets made up the overwhelming majority of revenue for all Guangdong's companies, with the requisite realization that only diversification of Guangdong's export market could salvage the economy. Chief Executive Takuji flipped open the thicket report on his desk, a dossier detailing the markets with the greatest opportunities for growth, detailing the future of Guangdong. Latin America and the Mediterranean markets are best suited for expansion. Neither region has close ties to Germany or America, yet reducing the threat of embargo. Additionally, investing in these markets may also deepen ties between them and the spear, reducing American and German influence by proxy. It's a start. Preferences, proclivities, we can handle the research. After that, the companies are on their own. Let's explore our options. After you see the crisis short struck the entire spear, we can now look to new foreign markets to sell our products to. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, that'll be in 248 days when we have to worry about that. But that will be nice once we get it. Uh-oh. Um, that's not so nice. But we'll worry about that later. The truck rumbled slowly through the nighttime streets, Highlight headlights illuminating what the moon could not. 
In the hours of the early morning, there was little human activity besides the escort cars in front and behind. A stray piece of garbage drifted across Taxing Street as Koki stepped down, preparing to round the corner. Besides that, the night was still and calm, almost peaceful. The cargo inside was equally silent, the world as yet unaware of its present purpose. Then Koiki saw the man jump in front of the escort car, which came to screeching art. Just as the man inside the car opened the window, Sandra raised his arm and fired, landing straight into the escort driver's head. The man and guards barely had enough time to reach for their own weapons before there were windows on either side of the street shattered, calling forth for rain of lead and shards. Trucks shook from the impact as Koiki ducked for cover, punctured bags of raw opium spilling through freshly opened holes in the canopy. His brothers returned fire wildly into the buildings on both sides, sending a couple bodies tumbling to the ground. Whether they were aligned with the attackers or innocent bystanders, Koki could not tell. A wet, fleshy sensation enveloped him as his brother in the passenger seat and keeled over onto him. While Koiki violently thrashed, without really even looking at the road, he floored the gas pedal and the truck lurched forward. He barely even noticed a slam as the vehicle careened for around a corner. He prayed it wasn't one, one of his own as the truck sped into the black of night. With the goods in tow. Iberian Council. Matsuzawa wondered if it was, there was not a single desk in the whole of Guangdong was not piled high with paperwork. Such a thing existed, he thought, whilst looking at his own colorless mountain, would certainly not be anywhere within any government office. Ever since his first day on the job, there had been a stack of work taunting him. It only grown from that point. However, that time had not entirely gone to waste. The executive's outflows were beginning to match his inflows. The work was only becoming more bearable. The doom and gloom of earlier briefings had seemed to have dispersed recently. Decisiveness came clarity, and through cold determination, that Matsuzawa had got this far. In many ways, it was the only thing keeping him going, for everything else he had worked for was gone. Yasuda was dead now, there was no questioning that. His carcass had already been gutted and neatly trimmed in preparation for it to be sold off like tuna at a fish market. Nothing could be done to prevent it, yet the inevitability and mundanity of what was to come felt horrific. All the chief executive had w ever worked for it expired, and one day he would too. Though when that day came, it would pass no when he did all he could to avert disaster and dampen its consequences. Soon there would be one last piece of paper on his desk. One piece of paper that wouldn't end at all. His removal from Tokyo would come. Maybe then he will learn to rest. His purpose would soon be complete. Hmm. Locking off the uh, assets. So he just collapses, left our government with all important questions. What did he read to do for remains? Since his Ibatsu's, whose assets in Guangdong were entrusted to us, creditors, creditors circle our government like carry-on vultures, eyeing the assets hungry. Unfortunately, we cannot keep these prices of Yisuda much longer. Pieces of Yisuda much longer. With their maintenance costs draining, are already dwindling, dwindling reserves. The solution has been put forth to auction off Yisuda assets to willing buyers. We could kill multiple birds with one stone, selling the assets would fill our reserves again, eliminating the cost of maintaining the assets, and get the creditors off of our backs. It's an idea. Ooh. Great news from the executives and engineers of Guangdong is products and devices Increasing the overall efficiency of power usage has been released for this fiscal year. These products can save consumers and businesses massively in monthly energy costs, all while not compromising total output. Surely Pearl River Delta will be shining sun of a spear. I think my light bulbs are brighter now. Ooh, nice. Some nice general bonuses all around. Auction off your assets. Uh, we'll just take inventory for now. In order to sell Yasuda's old assets, we should determine what assets we hold and how much they are worth. The bureaucracy will be organi organized a comprehensive list of factories, subsidiaries, 
and properties formerly owned by Yasuda and determine their respective values. Uh, work on the new jet tanks. I, I don't really know. All around Matsuzawa, the sound of his firm heeled shoes colliding with the ground echoed off the solid concrete walls. Dolby dragged itself into crescendo as he'd reached the entrance of what had been the Grand Koshu headquarters of Isuda. Now it seemed more like a morgue sterilized of life. Across the room, the sight of cleaner twitched into the corners of the eyes. Nothing yet moved. The stillness felt strange to Matsuzawa. Every recent waking moment and his mind had been flooded by some rush or other. Times had always been almost been overwhelming. He decided to let go of any preoccupations in his mind, bracing the calm oblivion. However, he soon realized that as his mind had stopped, his body had followed. There's no time for such lack of action, as there never was. So Matsuzawa had heaved himself from the spot he had lingered and headed towards the elevator. In Spar's office, nestled with one of the many towering stories, a group of accountants haggled among themselves as they hunched over their work. They had been handpicked for the task of itemizing each and every of Yasuda's remaining Guangdong assets, and they were each doing an efficient job of it, not one of them knows Matsuzawa's arrival. Annuals crept up on the chief executive, but he stifled as best he could. A side of empty rooms and flickering lights and endless rows of numbers, clipped to ledgers, and reduced his spirits again. He'd hoped that this helplessness could be ignored, yet every time he determined to persist, it invaded, mind, it invaded his mind again. Something had to be done. Matsuzawa knew the total description of his life's work would come, but he could never be satisfied with his knowledge alone. He could still take action when the power was in his grasp and make one last move before the inevitable. To make a sale, first he must decide its worth. Um. No more, no less. The owner of Yasuda's former assets is our responsibility to determine the value of each asset as accurately as possible. Any manipulation of the values will be unfair and corrupt, which are attributes we cannot be affiliated of as of now. Um, we'll reinforce the Momai police. Uh oh, Hitler's dead. Arrangements for a meeting between Yokoi Hideki and Chief Executive Matsuzawa had been hastily drawn together after a spate of threats arriving at the front door of several accountants. Threats uh, which clearly been issued by the Yakuza. Normally such shadowy warnings would be ignored, however, what spiked Matsuzawa's anxiety was how each of the accountants who was threatened were involved with a break of Yasuda. The Yakuza were demanding that the properties had the, that had their interests be undervalued, something the Chief Executive cannot accept and, come hell or high tide, he was going to prevent it. Stop this. Stop this charade this instance. I cannot afford to bend to the whims of you people anymore. Not over this. There is no need for this drama. You'll have to deal with plenty of people worse than me so long as you're alive. If you keep that note, I'll make doubly sure of it. I mean it, Yokoi. It's not a place for your usual antics. Don't you forget that I have power too. It will by no means last forever, but it will be in my hands long enough to make the Activities of your various ventures. Very difficult indeed. Me continued for a little while younger, yet Yakoi knew that this was not the time to harass the chief executive. He did not commit himself to playing fair, nor did he resist any further. Before the two broke away, Matsuzawa made sure to fire one last warning shot to make sure his pretensions were not forgotten. Play by the rules for once, and wait in line like everyone else. Well, going once. Value of the assets have been determined, and the auctioneers are re relentless. The auction is about to begin, and with it, the growth of our coffers. It's time to start bidding. I gotta turn the uh, day-night loop off. Going once. Now, well, I'd say we'd, uh, See it go twice, but we're gonna have to wait till next time, because my vid up my uh, videos are now upload, going out usual schedule, and I gotta go and back. So until next, oh Jesus, fuck! The Philippines are kicking the fucking ma Yanks are kicking ass. I did not. Ah, 
Frodig's dead. That's sad. I didn't know that. I didn't know this guy could come charge. I, I shouldn't put it on. I shouldn't delay it anymore. Um, yeah. Got to uh, pack. So, thanks for watching, gang. As always, like, like, dislike if you didn't. Uh, sub if you want to, or hit the notification bell. And usual links are down in the description box below, and leaving comments you have down in the comment section below. Thanks always for watching, my friends. My name is Mr. Dogbot 3 Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.